When you play the Game of Thrones, you subscribe and like. Or you die. There is no middle ground. Before we get into this, I wanted to say a massive thank you for the advocate for the work he put into doing for this series. And if you guys do end up liking this, please subscribe to his channel. Um, try to get him to at least 500 subscribers. He does some great content. I just want to say this before I open the video because I want to say a massive thank you to him. I also want to say these will be posted at 4 p.m. U.S. Central Time on his channel tomorrow. So check that out if you did want to see more of our content. It's more of the same. This is all record one recording, just divvied up. But these will be released all the way up until Sunday. I hope you guys all enjoy, and I'll see you guys in the video. Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is The Advocate, and today we are advocates for Grease Goblins and The Advocate talk about House of the Dragon Season 2. Woo! And with me today, I've got my awesome guest, Grease Goblins. Grease, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, good sir. Hi, guys. This will be on my channel for the first video, but... For the videos going forward, because this will be a multi-part series, head over to the Advocates channel, make some quality content, oh, you're too kind. and we're here to talk about some House of the Dragon. Nice. Dude, you're too kind, dude. Thank you so much, man. <laughs> so, Grease, um, before we get started on the predictions proper, uh, why don't you go ahead and kind of give us some introductions. Tell us how you kind of got started on this whole A Song of Ice and Fire uh, YouTube thing. <laughs> Oh boy, we'll be here for a long time. We go down that <laughs> ripple, but um, more or less, I've just always liked the show for Game of Thrones, and then I read the books a lot when I was younger, and just really grew attached to them, really enjoyed them, and I just wanted to make content. Wanted to find other people that have the same interests. I don't have a lot of people in my real life that you know have read the books or anything like that, right, so right, yeah. that would be. More, mostly my introduction to why I wanted to do YouTube content for Song of Ice and Fire. Gotcha, gotcha. And you're also someone who watched the TV show prior to reading the books, correct? Yes, I read or I watched about the first four to five seasons, I think, um, and before I read the books. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's what I've noticed. Um, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. The, I mean, the books were already popular prior to the TV show, but after the TV show, definitely book sales skyrocketed. So most people were introduced first to the show before the, the books. Yeah. And also I was, so when I started watching the show, I was actually probably younger than I should have been to have been watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh that's okay no no hopefully nobody knew nobody no nobody knew no one is paying attention <laughs> oh no my dad introduced me to it so let's just <laughs> let's just leave it there <laughs> but i probably read the the books when i was a freshman in high school around then so that's how young i was oh. getting into song by some fire oh oh man oh dude well did you understand everything you were reading no of course not <laughs> so i was too <laughs> i was too young to like fully there's too much like the books have too many really hardcore like themes and just really deep concepts for my little developing brain to understand. But I gotcha. Oh man, yeah, I can imagine, especially uh, you know, just the little finger talking about brothels and then Danny. Yep. Everything involving Danny, I, the will probably fly over my head. I mean. Oh yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, that's that's cool, one dude. thing though about Daenerys though is like. I feel like when I was younger, I didn't really like Daenerys, especially in book one. Mm -hmm. And then I've gone back and I've gone older. I, I really like her um, POV in the first book. But yeah. yeah. What about yourself? How did you get into A Song of Ice and Fire? <laughs> so actually, believe it or not, I've only been a fan for four years now. So yeah, pretty recent. So the Game of Thrones TV show when it was first airing, like obviously I knew about it. It was really hard to escape. Like all my friends were talking about yep. it. It was impossible so unfortunately like the big spoilers uh such as you know ned stark's death and the red wedding like i knew about those i didn't know the context for the red wing i just knew that there was a wedding that people died and i knew that the main character died at season one um so it was hard to avoid those but i didn't for the longest time i didn't watch it and i don't really know why i think it's just i had other things going on in my life i was just so busy with other stuff um, yeah. So then finally, when season eight aired and all my friends were just talking so much trash about it, saying like, ah, oh, worst show ever. Oh, what no. a waste of time. <laughs> I was like, oh, brother, you're like, you must feel pretty passionate about this. They're like, oh, shit, the books are better. 
And so that got me thinking, was like, oh, okay, so the show is different from the books. And that's when I learned about like, oh, the books are incomplete, you know, all this other stuff. And that's kind of yep. what piqued my interest. So flash forward to 2020, uh, <laughs> COVID happened and I had a little bit more time on my hands. And so I was like, oh, you know, I had, someone had gifted me the A Song of Ice and Fire books and they were just kind of on my bookshelf for a while. And I was like, oh, now would be a perfect time to read these books of this TV show that everybody hates now. And I read them and I was like, holy shit, this is like the best thing ever. What the hell? How does everybody hate this thing? And yeah, then, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, they were so good. And then obviously, like, as I, like, once I finished reading it, I was like, okay, let's see why everybody hates this TV show. So then I, I sat down and I watched the TV show. And f again, for the first, like, two, three seasons, I was like, I mean, yeah, there were changes, but I was like, this is pretty good. This is pretty great. And then, you know, with each passing season, kind yep. of D&D &D start introducing their we know better than George stuff into the show and season gets, five is the biggest uh yeah <laughs> offender of that <laughs> yeah i was like oh man this has gone downhill really fast <laughs> and so yeah um i don't think but because everybody had all had was watching it week to week and i was just binging it i didn't hate it as much as everybody did but i could definitely tell that there was a sharp decline and it got exponentially worse so by the time season eight rolled around and i saw you know brand being king i was like oh okay yeah this makes this makes total sense why everybody hates this show yeah that was pretty stupid <laughs> yeah it, it, i think it's one of those things where when we look back on it it's like me being somebody that i the first time i remember like actively watching each episode as they came out was like season six area mm -hmm. and i think it's one of those things where Season six, it ends on such a high note that you almost forget about some of those eh, writing moments throughout right. the season. Right. And so it carried that on. That was one thing Game of Thrones did really well was it ended seasons really well, usually. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, carried the show later on, but it kind of got exposed later. But <laughs> moving on from that, uh, let's actually talk about Fire and Blood. So obviously, uh, I, I imagine that by the time you read Fire and Blood, you had already both read and watched the main series, Game of Thrones slash The Song of Fire and the Fire stuff, right? Yep, okay. I had. Gotcha, gotcha. Same here. Like, I uh, read Fire and Blood about, yeah, like about a year after I had read the A Song of Ice and Fire series. And uh, again, similar to Game of Thrones, all I heard from people was how Fire and Blood was this garbage book. It's like, where's Winds of Winter? Fire and Blood is so, like, this is not the book we wanted. And I, I truthfully, if I was a fan of this series in 2018 when Fire and Blood was released, I probably would have felt the same way. But because I had long since learned that George is probably not going to release Winds of Winter anytime soon, and that's probably still the case. Um, then I didn't really have a expectations of like, this isn't wins, you know, I'm going to hate it automatically. It's just like, all right, let's just see what it is. And, and lo and behold, I mean, it's not exactly like the, I mean, obviously it's completely different. It's a historical fiction compared oh, to, yeah. uh, you know, a song of ice and fire. That's a story about characters, but fire and blood was a really, really good book. Um, Greece, what, what are your thoughts on the fire and blood book? Oh, you set me up here because I'm a huge fan of Fire and Blood. I love Fire and Blood. There was a time where I don't know if I'd say this is now, but I used to like Fire and Blood more than A Feast for Crows, and it almost teetered on Dance the Dragons. Wow. But I'm kind of in the situation where when I read Fire and Blood, I had no expectations. I, I had not heard anybody talk about the book. I didn't know what was in the book. I right. just knew it was Aegon's Conquest going forward. Mm-hmm. So I think one of the things that did hurt Fire and Blood is I think people had expectations that it was going to be something else almost. Yeah. That like, oh, it wasn't the traditional Song of Ice and Fire story or it, you know, it isn't like Dunkin' Egg, right? It's not a story. I think, you know, Fire and Blood is something completely different and you have to enjoy it for what it is. Right. You right. know, a historical book where, you know, you're being questioned on what events happened, right? What do you believe? That's one of the best parts about House of the Dead Dragon is that you could really just do your own interpretation of characters. Right. No, it's, it, I mean, what you said earlier about how it's your own interpretation and what do you really believe? I think that's honestly the best part about Fire and Blood and what 
kind of makes it a better book than just a traditional kind of history textbook because especially throughout the dance of the dragon's war when you have the perspective of like uh the grand maester munkin and mushroom and um septon eustace you know the three of them have very different kind of perspectives on what happened during the dance of the dragon's war so then the reader then has to kind of try to puzzle out, okay, you know, I've got these three different testimonies. The truth is somewhere in the middle. Let me try to kind of create my own truth that takes into account all of these. And it's super interesting to do that for sure. I mean, think about one of the biggest mysteries of season one, like me personally going into season one of House of the Dragon. One of the biggest questions I had was how they were going to quite how they were going to do the Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole relationship. Because mm -hmm. I had my version of how I thought it was and they, you know, went their own way, which was kind of similar to what I thought. Yeah, but like in the book where you have so many different ways of how that could have happened yeah, or yeah. you have stuff like how is Damon in the books, right? Or how is he in the show? And, you know, it's just vastly different for me personally and Damon. But that's one of the things I really liked from first or season one. Yeah, I gotcha, gotcha. And I think, uh, by the way, thanks for setting that up beautifully and transitioning us to our next yep. topic, because uh, that's exactly what we're going to talk about here. Greece, House of the Dragon season one what are your thoughts on the first season of this tv show adaptation i think house of the dragon season one was really good mm -hmm. i was very critical of it because it's something i love i want it to be good it's one of my favorite time periods in song west and song west and fire and i think for the most part 90 percent of it was good yeah i think the pr they really struggled on if you look at game of thrones every episode kind of ends on this kind of cliffhanger in season one. They really struggled with, I think, ending those episodes, you know, whether it was like Joffrey's death by Kristen Cole, oh, yeah. or it was Rainey's coming out of the ground at Aegon's coronation, <laughs> or oh, it's, you know, this, the stepstones, they really struggled on the big moments, but did all the small moments right. In my opinion, that's the easiest way I can describe it. That's actually a really good description of the first season of House of the Dragon. It's like, you know, the little character moments like, you know, King Viserys finally sitting on his throne in episode eight or the very powerful scene in the very first episode where King Viserys has his queen wife opened up to save his baby that inevitably dies. Those the kind of character moments are done so, so well. But then it's like the big action sequences like uh, Damon dodging you know yeah. <laughs> striding through a bunch of uh arrow fire and somehow magic going john still... snow mode <laughs> <laughs> just going god mode and killing the crab feeder off screen or uh yeah rainy's like coming out from the ground killing a bunch of innocents and then not burning the greens yeah. i was like ah this is uh <laughs> very weird change um... <laughs> yeah. very weird additions um rainy's just killed hundreds of civilians but's not willing to stop the civil war by just killing these people i don't you know it is it, you know that yeah that's what it is but yeah i don't know speaking of which so like i personally i that episode is probably my least favorite of the first season um like i still like again like the a lot of what they do with the characters like especially queen allison like allison throughout like in the book she is just straight up like this evil stepmom like she's just very petty she hates rhaenyra for almost no reason but in the show, they do a really good job of adding nuance to her character. She's much more uh, layered. She's not just some petty stepmom, but no, like she's, you know, she's uh, worried about her kids. She cares about the kingdom. She even cares about King Viserys there a little bit, even though she was forced into this marriage. But that outside of that, that episode in particular, I was just like, you know, when Laris was having his little, uh, <laughs> his, his moment there, uh, yes mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> i was like what and then also you know i've heard the argument from people that like oh you know um rainy's coming out from you know the beast beneath the board scene like that was that was such a cool moment and it added so much to the story it's like no it didn't like she could have easily just fled to dragonstone and nothing in the story would have changed it's yeah. like, well, she needed to show up the greens to let them know that it's like, let them know what up to that point, she was still undecided on who she would team up with. Agreed. Yeah. It's just like, it, it was such a, a kind of a silly, almost stupid addition to the, to the show. And I was like, oh man, this, 
this is a pretty bad way to end the episode. And see, it's just so detrimental because it kind of goes against everything that George uses for themes, right? We're not glorifying death. And that right. scene really seemed to glorify Rainey's and as this heroic moment. It's like, no, she just killed a bunch of innocent people. Yeah, yeah. And also, the other thing is, I will be interested to see if they do anything with that scene. Yeah. Like, in terms of going forward, like, will there be any repercussions will, without going into spoilers? Will that have an impact on something later on? And stuff that happens yeah yeah no um i don't know if they will it it seems to me like they just added that rainy scene just to have the actress do something to give her that kind of hoorah moment but because besides that she doesn't really have any action scenes that season um yep so we'll see we'll see maybe they will acknowledge it in season two uh possibly we'll see We'll see. I will say one more thing because we were talking about a little bit there is one of my favorite scenes. And I think it's a lot of people's favorite scenes is like Viserys when he comes to Rhaenyra's uh, rescue in in episode eight. But like, I think it's just so interesting that the, my favorite moments of season one were not like action. They weren't the big moments. They were like, like just simple moments for character growth. Yeah. Like Allison walking out with her green dress her signature, what she's going to be going forward with. Love that scene. And I'm a big Rhaenyra guy. I'm a big team black guy. So that says a lot. <laughs> no, I think you and I think a lot of light. Um, there, there is a lot to be said about how the producers of House of the Dragon just de- did these uh, kind of non-action scenes really well. These scenes that focus solely on the story or s- focus solely on our characters as characters. I think those scenes are brilliantly done. It's honestly just kind of the, the high octane action that's... Uh, you know a little you lacking ca- yeah you kind of poke holes in it it's like oh it's not story here doesn't really make much sense what the heck yeah i mean to me the characters that had the best two character arcs that were the best developed throughout the entire season were viserys and allison and they have nothing to do with action <laughs> oh yeah i mean viserys dies before even all the action starts so yep yeah okay cool um so i guess in that same vein we kind of talked about a little bit. Do you think that up to this point, House of the Dragon has been a good adaptation of Fire and Blood? I definitely think so. I, I think there is things that it's like, you know, we talked about them already that it's, you know, they added in things that obviously weren't in the book or I think they did a really good job with the material mm-hmm. in terms of we don't know a lot of the character personalities and we have to kind of sift through information like what was Rainier and Damon's relationship or how is Viserys and Damon's relationship? We get some of that in the book, but it's not fully developed. Right. I think they did a lot of those things really well. And again, I think 90, 95% of it was good adaptation. It was just a little bit there that hopefully they take that criticism and they move forward in season two and, you know, do better. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) just just you wait they're gonna take your advice and do the exact opposite and be like oh greece likes uh smart character moments and uh these calm quiet scenes no screw that we're gonna just get all the blood and and boobs and oh no uh, <laughs> and laris laris is member and just put it all on the screen mm, don't oh, you sure. so that's what, what we want to see it's what we want to see <laughs> perfect perfect um yeah no i agree with you i think uh house of the dragon was a pretty damn good adaptation of the source material i really like how um even though i don't agree with all the decisions they made uh, i like how most of the decisions they they kind of kind of going back to the having three different perspectives on the events of the dance of the dragon's war they kind of more closely stuck to mushrooms version of events and if i was a producer that's honestly the route i would have taken for my tv show because mushroom has the most uh kind of salacious outlandish yes. account of events it's the most fun stuff and i'm like oh yeah like a story just about mushrooms version of events would be cool and like eight times out of ten they follow mushroom I'm like oh yeah this this is perfect but there's no mushroom where's mushroom at? <laughs> <laughs> so i the producers have mentioned that they actually have him kind of sort of like a as a where's waldo situation they kind of have him hidden in the background in every episode oh okay. i've only seen him in two episodes i saw him uh in episode five where they're having the the feast there um pr- prior to when allison walks in with the green dress uh, there's a okay. couple people on the drums and so you see mushroom there just kind of banging on the drums and then another scene 
was uh, in the dragon pit where you see like the people playing the trombone or not the trombone, whatever, whatever instrument they have to signal uh, the uh, Igon, Igon the eldest introduction into the, into the dragon pit. Um, you see mushroom there kind of for like a split second. It's very quick, but he's right there. So okay. I'm sure he's in other scenes. I just need to do a rewatch uh, to catch him in other scenes. Interesting. I did not know that until now. Yeah, yeah. He's he's. I mean, the producers have alleged he's in every episode. Uh, so alleged, <laughs> alleged. Correct. <laughs> I hope you guys all enjoyed part one. If you want to see more of this discussion, make sure you check out the Advocates channel. It will be released the same time as it was today, four p.m. U.S. Central Time, over on his channel, and then it'll be back on mine, and then his once again. Hope you guys all enjoyed. Please subscribe to his channel as he put a lot of work into this. This was mainly his project that I'm kind of just trying to help along with, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it.